Welcome to Build. I'm Laura Haywood, and we're about to have the best day ever. Tony nominee Kyle Jarrow is here to discuss the celebrated smash show, SpongeBob SquarePants, the Broadway musical. Kyle wrote a brand new adventure for SpongeBob, Squidward, Patrick Starr, Sandy Cheeks, and the rainbow of lovable citizens of Bikini Bottom. If you've never seen the TV show, though, fret not. This innovative, brilliant production is a complete delight, whether or not you're familiar with the brand. Let's take a look at SpongeBob on Broadway. Broadway. So come on, hero is our middle name. Fixing trouble is our game. Courage is your claim to fame. When hero is your middle name, give me adventure. I'm a contender and more. I will show I'm not just the sponge. Next door. A typical extraordinary day. Uh, this is not a typical show, but it is absolutely extraordinary. I love it. Thank you so much for saying that. I think it's especially important to note that this is a show that I was not sure I would love. You know, I you go, walk through Times Square, you see sp the like SpongeBob, the fake SpongeBob guy in a costume, and then you imagine him like tap dancing on a Broadway stage and it's like, really? That doesn't sound good to you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, so, so there has, like, how, how does the process of taking this intensely commercial, very well-known brand and turning it into something that, as we saw from the clip, is in, in innately theatrical, how does that happen? Take us through the process. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's really the challenge, right? We knew that a lot of people would think it was going to be the guy from Times Square tap dancing on stage, and we wanted to make something cooler than that, and we wanted to make something that felt like it needed to be theater, right? Mm -hmm. And that it it could be different from, you know, there's a million episodes of the TV show, which are great. There's a couple movies which are great, but how did we make something that needed to be live on stage? Mm -hmm. That was really the challenge, right? And the first thing we knew is there couldn't be a foam suit. <laughs> so one of the big questions was like, what do these people look like? Yeah. You know, these what do these fish look like? Mm -hmm. um, and I wish I could take more credit for the genius behind the solve there, but it's really David Zinn, the costume designer, and Tina Landau, the director, who figured that out. But sort of once we knew that we were going to be reimagining the way these characters looked, it kind of gave me license to be like, okay, we're reimagining this world. So just as we're reimagining it costume-wise, I can kind of reimagine it script-wise, mm -hmm. too. So that kind of... I, I think we all felt that we had a certain freedom that let us tackle that problem in like the most creative ways we could. That doesn't totally answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well... But yeah, so I, I guess the answer to your question is we knew that what you said is what we had to do. And the development process was trying different roads to get there yeah. and figuring out what worked and going down those paths once once we found them. Yeah. I love this image that is used on the playbill and in the in the um, the key art because you know, these are light bulbs and you look at it and you see a you see a recognizable object, but done in a completely innovative way. And I feel like that's what this show does. Everything is found objects. And um, can you just describe the design a little bit for people who haven't seen it? Yeah, totally. So it, for people who've watched the TV show, the world of Bikini Bottom actually is created from found objects. You know, the reason that uh, SpongeBob lives in a pineapple is because it fell from above into the ocean, right? And 
the chum bucket, which is uh, Plankton's <laughs> restaurant, is mm -hmm. actually a chum bucket with actually a glove attached. So we took that idea, and the design of the show, everything is created from found objects. There's um, hula hoops create these giant shapes on stage. Um, the costumes are made out of found objects. There's a costume that's partially built out of latex gloves. Um, so really taking that idea uh, and, and going as far as we could with it, and thinking about that idea, one of the things that Tina, the director, always said is like, you know what, this is a DIY universe, mm -hmm. right? Like in the TV show, these fish are taking objects that fell from the surface mm -hmm. and they're turning them into their home. So in the same way, we really tried to take that DIY approach to the show. So yeah, like there's some stage effects and stuff, but for the most part, you can see what's happening, right? It's not a show where like giant things are coming out of the floor. It's a show where... Ethan, who plays SpongeBob, is climbing a giant 18-foot ladder wall. Yeah. And it's built out of ladders, yeah. right? But it represents the mouth of a volcano. So, you know, that's kind of the way that we try to take that idea and, and take it as far as we could. And, yeah, I love the key art, too. I think it really captures that. Totally. You're a little SpongeBob-y yourself. I feel like <laughs> you have a similar energy, is too. Is that a compliment? I'll take it as it, a compliment. Oh, my gosh, it is. He's the most joyful, delightful, like, adorable guy on Broadway. So, yes, I meant it as a compliment. That's, you know what? <laughs> Thank you. I, Ethan, who plays SpongeBob, oh I think gosh. like is truly SpongeBob. Of course, uh, in in his personal life too. We should say um, I, Tony nominated Best Actor. Absolutely, Tony Ethan nominated Slater. Best Actor, Ethan Slater. So I can only aspire to be as SpongeBob <laughs> as he is, um, but. I'll take that. Thanks. So you took these characters who have had, as you said, millions of stories written about them already and came up with uh, a maybe new, thousands, a new adventure for them. I understand you watched just about every episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, <laughs> were you careful? Did you have to be careful not to accidentally plagiarize a story for them that had already been written? Uh, a, a little bit, yeah. But the big difference is that the episodes are 11 minutes long. Right. So... You know, we needed to create, a, a, you know, a story that, that could sustain, you know, two hours plus of, of event, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, there actually are some moments, a few, that are sort of references to actual episodes. I'm not going to use the word plagiarize. I'll say they're <laughs> homages. Well, of course. I mean, I guess you can't plagiarize somebody that, like, has L licensed let, let you, you to do use it. their... <laughs> <laughs> that was the wrong choice of words, but but your story is original. That's yeah, what absolutely. I Absolutely. But I guess what, what I'm saying is that there just wasn't an existing episode that would have given us enough story to build this evening. So it was sort of necessary to create a new thing. So yeah, I just watched as many episodes as I could. Um, Tina and I went out to California. We met with the executive producers and a bunch of the animators of the TV show, heard about the process, heard about the things that like SpongeBob would never do. Mm. Which There's not many, but one of them has fall in love. They just never oh, yeah. do that. And then sort of went back with all that stuff in my head and just dreamed up a bunch of story ideas. That is fascinating to me that SpongeBob as a character would never fall in love. Well, so apparently they tried in an early season. There's an episode where they kind of tease a romance between him and Sandy. And I guess they just really felt it didn't work. Like it just wasn't true to the character. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the cardinal rules is, is SpongeBob doesn't have romance. Other people can. Like mm -hmm. in our show, Plankton and Karen who are married oh. kind of get like a little spice back in their marriage. A one-celled organism and a computer. I mean, that's sexy, right? And, and they're both represented on stage in a completely believable way. You know, <laughs> I look at Wes Taylor, who plays Plankton, and I believe he's a one-celled character. And then I look he's at Karen, and I believe that she is actually a computer yeah, Stephanie that has fallen Shue. through she the ocean. Is amazing. And, like, and I believe their love affair, and this is just such a testament to the, the production. And I think the key is, like you said, bringing Tina Landau in, who's known for this avant-garde, edgy, off-Broadway, sort of downtowny stuff, and marrying her to, um, like, a super commercial brand um, and letting her, like... Uh, sort of extract the theatricality out of the source material to create something no one's ever seen before. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really what we all tried to do. And, and Tina, for sure, was the captain of that ship. I mean, this is kind of cheesy to say, but it's true. And, and you know it's true. It's really tough to get a show on Broadway. Yeah. It's a lot easier if you have a big brand or existing piece of IP attached. Mm -hmm. 
But it's, that comes with a huge responsibility, right? There's a huge audience. And so it feels like if you have this opportunity, which we were so lucky to get, to bring a piece of IP that has a huge viewership to the huge audience of Broadway, I feel like you have an opportunity to make something great yeah. and something really cool. And what's tough is a lot of times the process gets in the way of that, mm -hmm. right? Like it, there's, there's a lot of people who have to weigh in. There's a lot of people spending money. And sometimes things get watered down, and we've all seen that happen. So I think the challenge on this was we knew we wanted to take this opportunity and make something super dope and something that that could matter and could say something that mattered. Yeah. And then the key was how do you get through the development process of a musical and all the different people and uh, and and ideas that you have to satisfy and still have it be dope at the end of that process. Yeah. I mean, that's really the challenge. And I have to say... Tina impressed me so much with how she navigated that and how she helped all of us navigate that. I'm Tina Landau's biggest fan. She's dude, she's awesome. Yeah. And it's tough with something like this because there's, you know, it it's so beloved and there's so many fans, including myself, and you gotta do right by the fans. But you also gotta find a way to do right by the fans and create something that feels fresh. So yeah, I feel like we did it. I don't know. I feel like I can pat us on the back for that, but it, it was not easy to, to find that kind of sweet spot. Let's talk about your collaborators. It's mostly no names like Aerosmith, John Legend, Sarah Bareilles. Um, the every song in the show is written by a different like icon of music. And usually, when I talk to um, lyricists and uh, you know music writers and book writers. I have them in the room together and I say, how do you guys work together? Which comes first, you know? And in this case, not only were you working remotely from these artists, but you there were so many of them. Can you talk about the process of like the sort of which came first, songs versus story, and also uh, what your collaboration process was like with all of these, this variety of, of artists? Yeah, totally. So. You know, we honestly weren't sure that it was going to work. Mm -hmm. It sounded like a great idea. The idea came from the fact that, you know, the, like, movie soundtracks often have, you know, tons of different artists who write songs. So we were kind of like, well, why not do that for Broadway? But to my knowledge, no one's ever done that, or uh, probably someone has. I'm not aware of it. <laughs> uh, so we weren't totally sure how it was going to work. And the truth is it actually worked great. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, so the way it worked for us was... Um, I did an outline of the show and like song spotted, which means, you know, choosing like, okay, here's a song. I think the song would be about this. This is who sings it. And then we would say, okay, who would be awesome to write this song? So you'd go like, okay, Patrick and SpongeBob need a song to sort of set up what their relationship is. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll just, as a placeholder, call it the best friend song. Exactly right. Yeah. We, yeah, exactly right. And here's some ideas of like some metaphors that might be useful in the lyrics mm -hmm. and sort of where we'd like them to go in the course of the song. And who would be great to write this song? In that case, Plain White Tees. Mm -hmm. Let's reach out to the Plain White Tees and see if they say yes. And, then, and so you like just Google phone number <laughs> plain white tees <laughs> and you're like, hi, it's Kyle Jarrow. Um, can you write me a best friend song? Hey, thanks. Bye. Like, I mean, it works. No, uh, <laughs> we will. So we, we were really lucky because there's a guy named Doug Cohn who works at Nickelodeon who I, I actually don't know his total, his title. I think he's like VP of music maybe. Okay. But he has relationships with a lot of artists because Nickelodeon does like kids choice awards mm. and all these other things. So a lot of these bands, he knew either the band members or their management. So actually what would happen is we'd identify who we wanted. We'd go to him. He'd say, okay, I actually know how to get to that person. And then he would reach out. Mm -hmm. And then if there was interest, and which there almost always was, I think because people really love SpongeBob. All these artists, like either they grew up with it or they have kids who did. So almost everyone said yes. And then the creative discussion would happen. And we'd give them this kind of brief on like what the song needed to do. And they'd do a draft and it'd come back to us. And Tina and I would give notes and there'd be a couple back and forths. But really like the special sauce is Tom Kitt, who's the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So what he would do is he'd take these demos that would come in and he would, you know, orchestrate them and arrange them. And then in the rehearsal process, when you're building a musical, like sometimes you're like, you know what, we don't need that verse or we need a longer vamp here, whatever. He would then do that work and then share it back with the artist and make sure, hey, is this okay? And just get the approval on it. But that allowed us to work 
especially when we were in rehearsals, yeah. a little bit more like a traditional musical where you actually are changing things on the fly. I think if we hadn't had him, it would have been really tough to work remotely. But with him, it was it was kind of great because yeah. these amazing artists would give us songs. We could tweak them if we needed, and and then he sort of managed the relationship with them. So honestly, like he's kind of the hero of the scenario, I have to say. Would you say hero is his middle name? <laughs> I might, yeah, I would say that. <laughs> He, I mean, he's a total genius, as you know. Yes, um, I believe he has a Pulitzer. He does. <laughs> for next but you know what's normal. so funny? Like, he's a Pulitzer, which could make somebody arrogant, perhaps deservedly so. But he's, like, the most, like, modest guy. And I think that's part of why he was great at interfacing with these artists. Mm -hmm. Because he was like, look, I love your song. Here's a couple tweaks we want to make. And the artist just felt really safe and taken care of. That's awesome. Yeah. I've heard nothing but really joyful things from everyone on the inside of this production, too. I th feel like people are excited to go to work. And you just had your 200th Broadway performance. We did. Include previews. I think you're up to about 230 now. Yeah, and the show true. is still going strong. I mean, as if Times Square wasn't already, like, crowded enough. Be careful walking by the Palace Theater right before a show because the lines, the crowds are out the door. Everyone wants their picture in front of them. I know. I feel, there's a hotel right there. And I feel <laughs> so bad because, like, the entrance of the hotel, you, no one can get in right before the shows. Whatever. Well, it's not, Sorry, a bad, uh, not a bad advertisement for... Yeah. For SpongeBob on Broadway. Um, so, okay, so I know we sort of circled past it, but I want to come back around to this SpongeBob can never fall in love thing because it's very rare that a Broadway show doesn't have a love story. Um, and I think that that is something that, you know, especially the old musicals, you, d you would identify a comedy by the fact that everybody got married at the end, and usually there were like three marriages all simultaneously at, you There's know. like comic couple and like ingenue couple right. usually, right? Yeah, and then sometimes even like the villains end up falling in love at the end. Um, and then a tragedy would be, you know, everybody dies. And that was how you identified these musicals. But one of the edgiest and most progressive things about this show, I think, and I am stealing shamelessly from one of my favorite journalists, Nicole Saratore. Oh, she's awesome, and like this, our biggest fan. She <laughs> wrote this her. piece uh, for Exeunt.com, which talks about basically the fact that SpongeBob and Patrick have uh, a relationship that is loving and devoted, but not sexual, is groundbreaking in a way, that there is so much love, there actually is a love story, but it's not romantic, it's not sexual, there's a lot of gender fluidity in this world, but not in a way that feels preachy or um, like, it, or political in any way, um, and, and that's one of the things that makes it sort of simultaneously uh, G-rated and also exceptionally progressive. Um, thank you. And I read that article by Nicole, and it was, like, super flattering. Yeah. I mean, look, the show's, at, at its core, at least, I think, to me and, and to a lot of us who work on it, it's about community. Mm -hmm. And it's about how community responds to crisis, right? Like, in the show, for people who haven't seen it, um, there's a volcano that's going to erupt and obliterate Bikini Bottom. And the show's really about how... I was going to say people, but fish, yeah. respond to that, right? And some of them turn against each other. Some of them freak out. They want to leave. Um, some of them want to save the home. Um, but at, at, at its core, it's about a community and how a community deals. Mm -hmm. And community is about diversity, right? And, like, Bikini Bottom's about that, too. There's all these different kinds of fish. Mm -hmm. There's even a land mammal, <gasps> Sandy what? the Squirrel. Um, so it just... To us, it felt like the show was a way to tell a story about how community is important and community coming together is important and diversity in a community is important. And so, yeah, reflecting that on stage in terms of, you know, some gender fluid characters. I mean, they're fish. Like, well, they're there are fish that don't have gender right. or switch gender. Isn't that I, I have studied about these, yeah. these like aquatic animals that aren't gender specific and it just what a felt perfect right. way to to put that on yeah, stage. You know, thank you. And and in terms of the SpongeBob Patrick relationship, I mean that it is a love story. I know. And it's a love story between friends. And and yeah, I mean that honestly that is the heart of the TV series too, mm -hmm. and it just felt so right to do that. Um, but one thing I will say is that like romance storylines almost always are about power or power is a big part of them. And I think one of the things that's so special about 
friendship and and SpongeBob and Patrick is it's not about power and there's like a purity in that that I think is really special and doesn't get explored enough. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. For me as a writer, it was really fun to get to deal with a relationship where power is not the issue. Yeah, it's it's interesting because the show it's new on Broadway this season. It's um, it feels incredibly current. Like it feels like there are specific things that refer to specific stuff going on in our world. I'll just leave it at that. But you've been working on this story for five years. So some of these things were not inspired by the world as it stands right now. H- like, wh- what's that about? Were you just being predictive? Is this stuff, is it circular? I mean, you know, a little bit of both. Um, like I said, the show at its core is about, we kind of describe it as like Armageddon, the movie Armageddon, meets Our Town meets SpongeBob, right? <laughs> so it's about a community <laughs> dealing with like potential apocalypse. Mm-hmm. and The j- and most joyful apocalypse of all time. Ex- yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, the idea was to do the craziest show that, like, no one would believe you're doing a show about that. Mm-hmm. So SpongeBob at the end of the world, that felt like it checked that box. But, like I was saying, it's about community, and it's about how people and communities respond to fear. And so, frankly, what happened in the time since we started writing it is, let's just be real, like, a president got elected who won based on fear, politics that are based on fear. Mm-hmm. Whether you support him or not, that's just true. Like, that's what the language of the election was about. And so that theme that we were writing about, I think, is just, you know, more current than ever now. Um, How do we respond to fear? And do we scapegoat or scape squirrel in this case? (laughs) Um, You know, folks in the community or not? So I don't know. It just turned out that the theme that I was writing about ended up becoming really current. And I will admit that there were a couple of tweaks that that then were done to uh-huh. sort of make that a little bit clearer. Um, but I want to be I want to be clear that the show doesn't have a political agenda. Yeah. Um, Unless in, you consider inclusion a political agenda, which I mean, maybe so, <laughs> honestly, some people might Roseanne Barr might, might consider that a political agenda. But I think at the end of the day, to me, yeah, it's a show about inclusion. It's a show about community is big, can be diverse. There's room for everybody. So look, if there's a political agenda, it's just that like, hey, don't cast people out of the community because they're different. Embrace them. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think that it plays as being a political piece. Definitely. So even though it, it it definitely talks about the moment we're in, we really wanted to be careful not to do a piece that's political c- mm-hmm. for a couple of reasons. That ages really quickly. And also, it you know, we advertise it as the Broadway show for everyone, mm-hmm. or that was a tagline at one point. <laughs> Not on there. But that's really true. Like, it is a show for everyone. Like, from five years old to, like, 95, whatever your political stripe is, like, it's about inclusion, you know, in the audience as well. So we wanted to really make sure that we made a show that felt that way. And in addition, I think it's important to note, you do not have to know SpongeBob or have seen the show. Inclusive in that way, too. Yeah. Um, We're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Before we do that, I I want to make sure I don't miss the the opportunity to encourage everybody to check out your band Sky Pony that that oh, you, thank you. Um, w- you have created with your incredible, also Tony nominated wife Lauren Warsham. You also have a beautiful baby. You can go online and watch stories of their first date and see baby pictures and stuff. Um, but so Sky Pony, check it out. SpongeBob is not the only thing Kyle Jarrow has done. I wish we had another three hours so we could <laughs> dig into your entire career. But let's let the audience ask you a couple of questions. Let's do it. We say yeah. Goodbye. Thank you guys for being here. Hi, Kyle. My name is Danny, and uh, my question is, you being a man wearing many hats and having all these different creative mediums, um, how do you approach that? Uh, did you start off mastering one creative medium and then developing the others? or? Um, that's a great question. I do not think I've mastered any of them, but I appreciate that. Spoken like a true master, always <laughs> growing and working. Um, you know, honestly, I think I'm a little ADD. And for me, I just, I don't know. I like to have a lot of projects going at once. A little bit to make a living as a, as a writer, you kind of need to have a bunch of balls in the air. So for me, like all the different media, like I work, I have a band. As you mentioned, I, I work in film and TV as well. I don't know, it's all like slightly different parts of my brain. And it kind of keeps me 
excited about it, if that makes sense. So I think it's a little bit of a function of like the ADD. Uh, but I will say they all kind of inform each other. You know what I mean? Like I'll be working on a TV script and I don't know, like it'll kind of inspire the theater writing. And so I guess I just try to find the connections between them and I don't know. I kind of dig it. But I have to say, I think many people um, do work in all those media now just because again, to sort of make a living, and also the lines between them are starting to blur a little bit. So I, I think it's um, not uncommon to, to kind of have fingers in all those different pots. Yeah. Since you are a songwriter, did you try to, like, elbow your way into SpongeBob to get to write for this incredible score? I totally did not. Why I, not? Because I'm not <laughs> flaming lips. I'm not T.I. Like, I, you know... Just, also, can you imagine Sky Pony on a list? With I, mean, all, I mean, come it on. It would have been great, but let's be real. Like, it, people look at the list of, of artists and they're like, holy crap, like D D David Bowie and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And then they'd be like, and Sky Pony? Who's that? Um, but also, to your point, I think it can be dangerous to wear too many hats on one project. Mm. And that I try not to do. Because it's, it's, especially a big Broadway musical, like there's so many facets of it. So for me, being in my lane, which is like I'm responsible for the spoken text, I'm responsible for the structure, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on, I think that was actually really healthy. And, and to also be a songwriter, I just think it would have been, it would have been too many hats in, in that context. Yeah. Got it. Um, does someone else have a question? Hi. So I'm interested in knowing who's your favorite SpongeBob character, and do you have a different character that's your favorite from the animated series based on the play? Oh, wow. So, like, who's my favorite in the series, who's my favorite in the play? That is a great question. Um, I think Patrick is my favorite in the TV series. Um, he's just, like, he's stupid, but also, <laughs> but also really confident, which is, like, a really hilarious combination. Um, and honestly, he's my favorite in the show, too. He was my favorite character to write. Danny Skinner, who plays him, does it brilliantly. I don't know. I just love Patrick. Yeah. I think his kindness uh, also contributes because we have seen some examples of stupid and confident that are not so adorable. I don't know what you're talking about. So we'll about. just put kindness as crucial to that combination of what makes him lo lovable, yeah. if you don't mind me putting words you're in You're totally mouth. right. And also loyal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, he he's like a bulldog with loyalty for SpongeBob. And that's, that's kind of special, too. This whole show is so special. And every time someone goes, really, a SpongeBob musical, I want to grab them by the shoulders and shake them and go see it don't judge it until you see it because it is delightful and joyful and new and progressive and like it's it is one of the most theatrical things that I have ever seen and who cares where the source material came from maybe the source material got it greenlit because it got the funding in I don't know but when I look for new original innately theatrical works on stage this is exactly what I'm looking for. Oh, man. That is really moving. Thank you for saying that. Thank you and for Anyone being who hasn't here. seen it, I hope you listen to that. And go <laughs> check out the show. 12 Tony Award nominations. Everybody sees SpongeBob SquarePants, the Broadway musical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.